Welcome to Upon This Rock, our midweek Bible study from Solid Rock Drogheda. Delighted to have you with us again on this Wednesday evening and we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians again. But before we do that, Janice is going to lead us in a time of worship. <music> we thank Janice for leading us in worship. This is Upon This Rock. It's a Bible study, a verse by verse Bible study. I'm Nick Park and I'm taking us through the book of Galatians. Line upon line, precept upon precept, verse upon verse. We don't skip any bits out. We don't just deal with the nice parts or the bits that we feel comfortable or familiar with, but we're seeking to discover the whole counsel of God in this very crucial book of the New Testament. And we're now at the beginning of Galatians chapter 3. And this is the fifth of our uh, episodes on Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, it's Paul says, now he's just been dealing beforehand with uh, an incident that happened in the church in Antioch. He's been talking about how he didn't receive his gospel from men. It was from God, but it had the support of the other apostles, including the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. And he's described, he's, he's basically cleared the air about a confrontation he had with Peter when Peter got a bit hypocritical over uh, the acceptance of Gentiles into the church and, and Paul had to publicly set him right for the sake of the gospel. And now he, he all of all of the last up to the end of chapter two was talking to Peter, but now he focuses attention back on the Galatians. Ver, chapter three, verse one. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now when he calls the Galatians uh, foolish, it's literally unthinking. Uh, aniotos. Uh, neoio means to think 
And ah, when you put the letter A in front of a word in Greek, it means not. So, for example, a, a theist is somebody who believes in God. But you put the letter A in front of it, it's atheist. Now it means somebody who doesn't believe in God. So, anoetos means you foolish, you unthinking Galatians. You're not using your brains to think with the way that God told you to do so. And so, uh, Paul says, who has bewitched you? Now, he's He's not literally saying that they're in their cult or that this is a demonic spirit or a spell, but he's saying you'd almost think it was because he says, how on earth could you move away from the gospel of grace to become back into this? He says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now, obviously, they weren't there present at the crucifixion. The Galatians were not in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. It's not that Paul's been showing them pictures or the Jesus movie or anything like that. But he's saying he had painted word pictures for them. Why? Because the crucifixion was always at the center of Paul's preaching. Uh, we know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul says we determined only to preach Christ crucified. And so this was Paul's modus operandi. This is what he did everywhere. He preached Christ crucified. And so he can say, look, before your eyes, I've preached that so many times on the crucifixion of Christ. You should be able to just close your eyes and you can imagine it and you can see it as if it's happening in front of your eyes. And he's, the reason he's sharing this is because adding anything to the cross actually detracts from the cross. Paul's preaching was that the cross was all sufficient for salvation, faith in Jesus' death on the cross. So if you then turn around and say, well, it's faith in the cross, but you've got to keep the law as well, you're adding to the cross, but that actually takes away from the power of the cross. Verse 2, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard. And Paul takes them back to their initial salvation experience. Because actually this is something that is quite common in that false teachers are often not effective at or even interested in evangelism. When people are peddling a false teaching or a false doctrine, they tend to focus on people who are already Christians or have recently become Christians. We, we experienced this in our own church in Drogheda. We found that there were people would come into our services and they would, whenever we were uh, would, at a point in the service, we wanted to discover who was there for the first time. We'd say, who's here for the first time? Just lift your hand up. We'll give you a welcome pack. And then these false teachers were coming in and they were actually focusing on the people who raised their hands and immediately making a beeline for them and saying things like, Oh, well, you know, they don't really preach the true gospel here. If you come to our services, we'll, we, we, we'll show you the true message. We had, in the end, we had to kick them out of our services. But it was very notable that rather than winning people for Christ, they were trying to hijack people that had recently made a decision for Christ. And, you know, the false teachers in Galatians are doing the exact same thing. Uh, and Paul's saying, so, so don't listen to the stuff they've been trying to feed you after the event of your salvation, but think back to when you received the Spirit. Was it by the works of the law, like these guys were saying, or was it by believing what you heard? And, there, and, and when he took them back to that, you see, their salvation was not by obeying the works of the law. Their salvation was not by trying to be Jews. Their salvation was by simply putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 3, are you so foolish, there's that word again, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? So Paul's saying, look, your beginning was good, and you know your beginning was good because you don't regret getting saved. You know, you, you know that was one of the best things ever happened to you, the best thing that ever happened in your life. So if you started in the Spirit, why would you abandon that good beginning to move on into something else? That, that is foolishness. It's, it's illogical. It's, it's not thinking straight. Verse 4. Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? And of course, Paul's talking to a, a living church, a living body of people who had received the gospel with power. It's not just that they had made some kind of intellectual assent to a series of doctrines. No, this was not just a matter of belief. 
This was a life-changing experience of Jesus Christ. It was a personal experience, and also God had done miracles, because Paul says, did God work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? And so the Galatians are having to look at themselves and say, well, actually, uh, we, we came into this wonderful experience in Christ by believing, not by trying to be Jews. Uh, yeah, we saw miracles then, and the miracles came through faith, not through trying to obey the law. Verse 6, Paul says, So also Abraham believed God, and here he's quoting now from Genesis 15. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's credited. It literally is like a banking term. It was banked to his account of, of righteousness. Why? Because he took a step of faith. So even Abraham was not saved by being a Jew. Abraham was saved by faith. Um, so Paul is not coming with this argument of saying, hey, the, the Jewish faith going back to Moses and Abraham is bad, but now Christianity is good. No, Paul's saying this, the Jewish faith understood correctly is founded on faith, not on the works of the law. These people trying to get you to obey the law, they'll go back to Moses, and we'll look at Moses in a minute, says Paul. But let's go back further than that to Abraham. Abraham did not start his journey with God by trying to obey a list of rules. Abraham set out on his journey with God by believing God's word. Verse 7. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Now this would be so offensive to the Judaizers, the people that were trying to enforce the Jewish law on Gentiles, because their argument was, guys, it's great you've believed in Jesus, but you're not true sons of Abraham. We are, we're Jews, we're the children of Abraham. And if you follow our advice and start getting circumcised and obeying the food laws and everything else, then you will be a child of Abraham as well. But Paul says, no, those who have faith are the children of Abraham which was something actually, you go, you go right back to the beginning of the gospel and you go back to John the Baptist about, you know, don't, don't say you're sons of Abraham because God can raise up from these very stones sons of Abraham. So if God could raise up from the rocks and the stones by the River Jordan sons of Abraham, he could definitely do it from the Gentiles. And he did it by faith, not by them trying to obey the law. Verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul's making a really bold claim here. He's saying that he's not coming with a different gospel to the other apostles or to Jesus or even to Abraham. He's saying it's the one gospel that the gospel was announced in advance to Abraham and then it was uh, proclaimed and instituted by Jesus and then it was proclaimed by the first disciples, Peter and the rest of them, and now it's being proclaimed by Paul as well. It's the same gospel, Abraham, Jesus, Peter and the twelve and Paul. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, this is a, a quote from Deuteronomy. Now, un please understand, Paul is not criticizing the law. Paul is not saying the law is bad. As we read on, we'll see that he's saying quite the opposite. He's saying the law was good. It was a good mark. It was a mark that you were one of God's covenant people. Whenever you believed God's promises as one of God's covenant people, the way you declared, I'm one of God's covenant people, was you obeyed the law. And that meant uh, that under the law of Moses, you got circumcised, you obeyed food laws, you obeyed laws that separated you from everybody else to show that you were one of God's chosen people. So the law was a mark of those who had received the covenant uh, up to the coming of Jesus. And the law was also a signpost pointing to Jesus. So the law was good. The law was preparing the way for Jesus. But that was now fulfilled. But using the law as a means of gaining God's approval and saying, will you become acceptable in God's sight by obeying the law? That was to put yourself under a curse because nobody could obey 
the law 100%. So if you're trying to earn God's favor by obeying the law, and by the way, that was never part of the faith of Abraham. It was never part of the faith of Moses. It was never part of the, of the religion of the Jews through the Old Testament. They were not earning God's favor by, do, by obeying the law. They obeyed the law as a mark of who they were, God's covenant people. And even when they obeyed it imperfectly, they had sacrifices to offer for sin. They were still God's chosen people. And they knew that and God knew that and the people around them knew that but now you've got these people who are trying to make the keeping of the law the thing that gains God's favor and Paul says if you do that you're under a curse because you can never obey the whole law verse 11 clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because and now there's a, a, a quote here from Habakkuk the righteous will live by faith the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. And that, that's from Leviticus. So Paul's saying this, we either live by faith or we live by the law. Now that Jesus has come, we can't do both. If you're trying to live by the law now after the coming of Jesus, then actually you're not walking by faith. And, and, and if you walk by faith, you're not going to keep, you're not going to try and be justified and live by the law. And I'm not saying that you, I'm not saying that people deliberately disobey the law. I'm saying that they don't try to seek God's favor by it. They don't live by the law, making it the thing that justifies their existence and relationship with God. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or hung upon a tree. Now, Paul is not saying that the law is a curse. When he says the curse of the law, he's saying that the law has curses attached to it. The law said you are blessed if you do that, cursed if you do this. And those curses no longer apply to us. The curses that were incurred by disobeying the law have been carried now upon the shoulders of Jesus when he died on the cross. And Jesus took all of those curses. Now, this is a beautiful thing because we can read the Old Testament and we can receive the blessings that come from keeping the law because we are in Christ and Jesus kept the law perfectly. But we don't need to uh, get stressed out that we're going to be afflicted by the curses that come from obeying the law because Jesus took all those curses and carried them on the cross for our sakes. And that's a glorious truth of the gospel. Verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, I want you to listen. There's three groups of people mentioned here. The first one is, is the Jews. Uh, the second group is the Gentiles. The third group is what Paul says we now, when Paul uses we here, he's including himself. So this is not just the Gentiles, but neither is it just the Jews. Because when Paul uses this we at the end of this verse, he's including Jews and Gentiles in it together. He's talking about the church. And this is entirely consistent with Paul's teaching elsewhere in Scripture. For example, in Ephesians, where he speaks about Jews and Gentiles. Out of the two, God has made one new man by removing the dividing wall of partition. So out of Jews and Gentiles, God makes the church. They're not, they're not just Jews, they're not just Gentiles, they're the church. So when it says he redeemed us, in order that the blessing given to Abraham, that was the blessings that the Jews were already in enjoying, uh, Jesus redeemed us so that those blessings might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And then by the blessings coming to both Jews and Gentiles alike, he says, so that by faith we, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, the we is not just Gentiles. Paul's not a Gentile. He, he is a Jew who has now come into the church of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's saying this, that God gave blessings to the Abraham and his descendants. That's the Jews. The reason why God gave those blessings was so that Jesus would come and the blessings might then come to the Gentiles through Christ. 
and that was so that all of us, Jews and Gentiles alike, might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. And this is the purpose and uh, the, the purpose and the reason for the redemptive work of Christ. Yes, it was so that Gentiles would come to know Christ, but it was also so that Jews would understand salvation better and they would put their faith in Christ. And so Jews and Gentiles together would be on this walk by the Holy Spirit, a walk of faith, not a walk of trying to keep the law, not, not a walk of numerous commands and commandments, but a walk of faith where the Holy Spirit would lead them into all righteousness through Jesus Christ. And that brings us up to the end of verse 14. And we're going to stop. We're going to, we're going to stop there. We will come back to Ephesians chapter 3 uh, next week. And I would invite you to join us for that for episode 6 of our Bible study uh, upon this rock of Galatians. And of course, that will be next Wednesday. Uh, same time, 7.30 p.m., same place here, here in my study, and invite you to join us then. But until then, be blessed in Jesus' name.